Welcome, Justin. Been a while, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's been a long while. Um, sucks I can't travel during all the COVID times. Otherwise, yeah, hope, hope, hope to make it back to Australia sometime soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, you're welcome, and we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll drag you out here one way or another, and uh, and uh, you're rep, repping the the Seahawks today, buddy. Yeah, Seahawks, uh, Seattle. You know, I can't be from Seattle and not rep the Seahawks. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And how's everything over there? Uh, it's pretty crazy. It's or crazy, what? yeah, crazy. Because it's like we've been having so much like uh, forest fires. Uh, a lot of it's all you know, man, man error, man made errors, uh, just because of our big holidays. A lot of people went camping. A lot of fires, and so it really took uh, uh, a dump on our air quality for the past two weeks. We had to stay inside. The air quality was really unhealthy. Uh, but now it finally rained here, and uh, it's the first time I kind of, like, was happy that it rained. <laughs> so, you know, just on top of more crazy COVID stuff, we got crazy fires and everything. So I was just like, okay, uh, what else is next? <laughs> What's yeah, next? Well, yeah, well, we did it the other way around, you know, in Australia. It was like the, we had all these crazy bushfires, then we went into COVID. So it's, it's all fantastic <laughs> yeah. for, uh, you know, tourism. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. But, but anyway, let's... Let's talk growth, baby. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, you know, I invited you out here. You know, it was the original startup grind, first APAC conference. You've always been like you've always kind of been in the growth space, whether that's you know, you know, from you know, crowdfunding campaigns through to you know, blockchain startups and and everything else. And I wanted to invite you on the show, which I'm calling Masters of Growth. I did want to go with Hacking Growth. But I was worried Sean Ellis was gonna kind of knock on my door and say, you know, <laughs> <He's> like, "Hey, <laughs> please stop." Um, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm gonna bring that up every time until I get Sean on the show. Um, all right. So I, you know, I am interested to hear about you know everyone kind of approaches growth differently. You know, you're quite famous for the for the term stacking growth. I actually brought it up with Sujan Patel, who was my first guest. I said, "Oh, you know." Uh, how do you stack growth? So I'm, I'm out there, I'm out there <laughs> plugging your methodology, man. Um, nice, so nice. If, if I'm, let, let's, let's start from, from the, the beginning. Well, can we get a little bit of background first? Let's give a bit of context for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I can give a uh, background. I'll summarize it as uh, short as possible, but long story short is uh, yeah, I got accidentally got into marketing when I started building, uh, my own websites for fun. It was about video games, Pokemon cards, all that fun stuff when I was little. Uh, I just realized that I could uh, put an ad on my website, which is Google AdSense, uh, and make magical internet money. Um, this was when I was like 12. And uh, kind of just got, got down into the whole rabbit hole of uh, online marketing and internet advertising. Uh, as I progressed through kind of my high school and college years, um, that's when I started taking more technical classes. So learning programming with computer science classes, uh, information architecture, uh, some business classes as well. Uh, and started to find that that mix of uh, becoming more technical started aligning very well with my marketing and growth uh, skills. Uh, because especially with uh, how marketing and social media and all the platforms started gravitating towards more data-driven uh, social apps, mobile apps, uh, faster internet, uh, it just brought everybody uh, into the internet and allowed me to uh, really focusing on utilizing technology to reach the masses. And that was not a thing back then where marketing was used to be mass media, radio, advertising, TV, um, the internet just blew up. And uh, as that progressed, and as more technology apps and software kind of progressed as well too, it got more complicated. Uh, so that's kind of where kind of I jumped into growth hacking, where I started combining my software development skills uh, and background into marketing, and then just started executing more marketing campaigns. So I could just deploy some campaigns uh, in a larger scale. Um, and this was like early on when like email marketing and uh, email marketing had no like real limits. Same thing with social media. You could just auto follow people for like, you know, like auto follow like millions of people. <laughs> and then before Cambridge Analytica and the whole Trump shenanigans, you know, you could scrape everybody's uh, Facebook uh, details and user ID freely. <laughs> um, so those are kind of like the golden ages of uh, 
or the golden dark ages, depending on what perspective of marketing that I kind of just jumped right into. Um, in terms of actually growth campaigns, uh, yeah, I just started out with uh, understanding that the internet marketing world or just marketing in general has so many different channels. Um, it's easy to get distracted. I just started one channel at a time. And that's where kind of the term stack and grow came from that you mentioned, where you just want to focus on one marketing channel, whether it be email, social, etc., and then just uh, commutatively add more channels as you go and look at growth as a whole picture uh, altogether. So I got, I got into involved with, uh, yeah, like you said, Kickstarter campaigns, raised over uh, $3 million of Kickstarter projects. A lot of them are hardware electronic projects. Uh, got into the crypto space as well, um, and then just built, had my own e-commerce uh, brands on the side that have been building in terms of like shops as well too. Um, you know, I, I think I'd say like I've at least touched or, or handled a client in in, the, in all these different uh, industries out there. And, and back then, when I was really young, especially, uh, I was just saying yes to every deal, <laughs> uh, unresponsibly. But uh, at the same time, I was learning a lot uh, early on too. And and because of that, just being able to take these playbooks across these different industries and apply it to any of the marketing campaigns I've uh, run currently and in the future. Yeah. So look, you know, like. I want to kind of get into a bit of the strategy because, you know, I, I think there's this kind of misconception, right? That they're, I hire a growth hacker and that they're going to have this silver bullet and like, yeah. that's it. It's going to go through the roof. Like why, you know, why haven't like, and, and I, so can you just talk a little bit about the strategy <laughs> behind these channels and, and like kind of shed some light on there? Um, yeah. Not being a silver bullet really. Right. Yeah, so the, I mean, there are a few growth hackers or marketers out there that have the magic uh, silver bullets out there, but it's it's really rare. And even then, it's uh, might be very specific to like a single platform. Like somebody's really good at TikTok and they know how to exploit the TikTok algorithm. Uh, somebody's really good at email marketing, etc. So you know, you might find some very single cha channel growth hackers or um, single channel or single industry uh, marketers. Uh, and you know, the only problem with that though is like they are a all or nothing, like one, uh, even or potentially a single use, uh, growth hacker. Meaning, once they've done their exploit, um, either that algorithm changes or the export changes and, and they're done. Uh, and so that doesn't result in a sustainable marketing or growth campaign to reliably uh, grow a business. So, while I gravitated towards you know the term growth hacker or growth hacking, um, you know, the greatest challenge is that it, it teaches kind of the wrong principles of wanting other marketers or even business owners to want those short, quick uh, wins without seeing the bigger picture that it's really about building up your brand, your content, your community, uh, uh, essentially building your more organic forms of, of marketing, which is like your email list, your social, your followers, your Facebook groups, your community. Um, things that you can just rely on and, and remarket to. Whereas a, a growth hack is trying to look for that massive spike and, and whether you can sustain that really just comes down to uh, your uh, managing your customers and expectations. Um, so for me, like while I started out with those like quick growth hack spikes and exploits, um, I really started gravitating towards back to like, you know, like the Silicon Valley startup brand uh, mindset, um, which was uh, product led growth. Um, and so my evolution now is uh, in terms of growth marketing does do, I do growth hacks and stuff too, but a lot of it, what I do now heavily relies on uh, more heavily uh, interactions with the product or using product to grow uh, in larger scales um, than, than the typical other like um, growth hacks and, and growth hack channels that you might see out there. Yeah, like I, 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 you know, I was, so we have at the Talent Institute, we train growth hackers, right? But I was like, you know, I was pitching, I was pitching it to a client and he said, oh, so like uh, a technical, technical marketer. I'm like, yeah, probably, but it doesn't sound as sexy, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But probably, yeah, probably, probably is technical, technical marketing, right? But, um, but yeah, like the, you mentioned the word sustainability because I think that's key, right? Because um, if you're mm -hmm. just thinking for these quick wins and stuff, often it, often it's not sustainable, right? Whereas if you kind of, structure yeah. it right you're looking at the data and then you you kind of get trying to get a few things churning along and then you're on to the next one um it's sustainable 
right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if you look at any type of marketing campaign out there, you know, it's always usually when it comes to how much traffic you can generate, how much eyeballs or awareness or impressions, uh, down to how much engagement and conversion you can get and what's the user acquisition costs um, for that. Obviously, the best growth hacks or the growth, best growth hack campaigns will get like near zero um, or even, um, you know, if it's super viral, um, even positive, super positive in terms of like if I were, uh, somebody referring another sale that just generates even more money. Uh, but in the end of the day, though, like if you think about it, um, most of the growth hacks that you do read out there, like the Airbnb growth hacks, Craigslist, all that stuff, um, they're just one time exploitations and some of them were super and highly technical. So if you're not uh, highly technical or you don't have the developer to help you execute those things, um, they're very hard to chase. And I just, that's why I say like the barrier to even try to find these and follow these growth hacks are uh, not sustainable. Um, what is sustainable though is um, doing uh, more of the, you know, um, solid uh, organic forms of marketing of building co uh, community, social content, et cetera. Um, but the methodology, methodology that is different though, um, which I think I'm sure that you guys uh, um, uh, all talk about and teach as well too, is um, just being very uh, data driven. So it's about just running experiments very fast and ideas to be a very agile marker, uh, marketer uh, and find what works and what doesn't work and tweak it um, until you find the campaigns that work really well and then sustain and just run that campaigns too. So. To me, like growth hacking is finding one th part of it is finding the the exploits. The other part, though, is just more so just being kind of like a scientist or an experimenter, where you just run. You're just instead of a traditional marketer, one internet marketer might just run only one campaign. Um, your a growth hacker uh, would be running like ten experiments and ten campaigns to um, just run on all cylinders, and um, all of them might fail except one. Um, then you just find what works and just double down on that as well too. But it's just the act of running those experimentations, I think, is is uh, super key. And what differentiates, uh, you know, like a good growth marketer, or growth growth hacker, um, versus uh, versus just a, a standard um, internet marketer. And do you and like you know if if I can get like you know tactical for a little bit, right? If if, mm -hmm. if, if I'm a if I'm a potential client and I'm coming to you and I'm you know I've got this, you know, streetwear label or or, or you know. It's just top of mind because I like streetwear, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what's kind of what's kind of the what's kind of the approach, the the kind of how you kind of go to market with this stuff now, and is is Facebook, you know, still the you know the go to for the for the testing and and the rest of it, or has you has it changed up a bit over the last few years with you know the emergence of you know. Trilla and TikTok and all you know, yeah. have all these mobile things grabbing mm -hmm. attention. Yeah, I'd still say like for me personally, like Facebook, Instagram is still like key. Um, when it comes to an econ business, though, I'd still say that email is the the, the most top notch that you can uh, go after um, in terms of uh, that should be the main channel for your for your growth. Um, in terms of like the emergence of like TikTok, like I think TikTok is, uh, you know, while I personally haven't dived into TikTok, but I know like the clients that I work with uh, heavily do, um, you know, the, the, the beauty about TikTok um, and Trilla and all these other new emerging consumer platforms is that, uh, you know, their algorithms are still, it's still easy to go viral right now. It's still easy to get attention and eyeballs. So if your customers are there, then yeah, you should definitely go and build campaigns around that. But if you're more like B2B, then obviously you go with LinkedIn. Um, which LinkedIn's algorithm has also been favorable um, and for the most part um, for content as well too. So uh, while, although, you know, while those platforms are new and shiny, um, if you still want quick results, like we're still seeing a lot of really great results from Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, a lot of the content now that we like to post is, is much more organic looking stuff. So this is like, we're using a lot of user generated content now, or at least reviews or at least content that sh shoots or a shot like user generation content, um, but using that as an advertising, meaning we'll get like a an influencer to do a review or an unboxing or like something that is a little bit more or organic, uh, but high quality too at the same time um, with somebody that's like an influencer or content creator that also, um, you know, presented, presents it in a nice way. 
we're seeing you know huge uplift uh, from that because uh, it's catching attention and it looks a little bit more organic on the on the news feed. Um, and then another another uh, another type of ad is just uh, we're doing a lot of you know a lot of very colorful ads as well too like pastel colors or um, even just change we're just doing stuff that kind of like disrupts the flow of when you're looking through the um, when you're scrolling through the uh, the timeline. Um, yeah. You know, just trying to catch attention, but not doing it in a way that's just too like, you know, like blinking and flashing and, and crazy, crazy amounts. Just having more motion and making the, the ad, even a, a static ad more fluid, I think, um, has the key uh, for yeah. us. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, right? Because I like, you know, this uh, the concept of um, disruption, right? You, you know, like, all, like, and I'm not talking about in the, you know sense of, you know, of innovation and, 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 you know, Clayton Christians and stuff, but the idea that um, we're just so bombarded with media all the time that we're, we're just trying to at least get that brain to like, like you said, I'm scrolling and I'm trying to disrupt the pattern that prevents yeah. somebody just skipping right over the ad. Right. Yep. Cause you know, everybody's getting fatigue uh, seeing ads every now and then, and they're look, trying to look for their, the content. And if they are the target audience you're looking for, then you should try to create the content that they would like to consume or have them stop, um, stop the scroll um, for. So it's just kind of like understanding your customers and the, the expectations and, and taking a look at the content that they're looking to consume uh, and trying to match make that um, and here, you know, um, and uh, connect them uh, to the pieces. But on that, right? Because I've, I've, you know, I've seen, you know, um, some content myself around, you know, unpacking that strategy. Do you, um, and what I mean is like, look, trying to uncover through research where your demographic hangs out and the content that kind of resonates with them. How deep do you go into like the research um, and how do you do that research? To yeah. Kind of yeah, pick the channels and stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's either me or somebody else on my team that will go ahead and do that. Um, usually, like, we, the way that I go about it is, like, I'll go ahead and create a separate uh, Instagram account, for example, uh, and then start looking at all the competitors' content, try to then search for other uh, pages uh, that are relevant to kind of, uh, you know, other branded pages, content creators that are creating content um, around, what the, uh, around that industry. Uh, and then from there, it's like, once you start liking or seeing some of the posts based on like trending hashtags, et cetera, then you start trading your own, um, your own search, uh, algorithm on that new account to kind of, uh, suggest you similar pages as well too. So like you go to like the explore page on, on Instagram, uh, after you're going through enough posts, it's going to, you rate fed the algorithm, um, some of the data points that you're kind of the pages that you will like, and they'll start suggesting or introducing you to other new pages of content that uh, is doing very well in, in the, the space or industry that you are kind of going after. And so that's how we're kind of like surfacing and, and finding new people. Um, as I'm going and, and growing, you know, sometimes I've just been outsourcing that to like virtual assistants or just like a distributed team um, to handle those tasks to just go and just source new new content creators and and videos to then research on what's really trending and and, and how how does the, the posts uh, and content aesthetically uh, look like um, when it comes to go no no sorry man it's really cool oh yeah yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you have to get that you have to get that new account because otherwise you've got all the legacy of your own so yeah program. you're gonna yeah. exactly so you just want to keep it clean um, keep it fresh and just search from from that account um, obviously if it's still on a platform like TikTok it's gonna be very different and the content on TikTok is a little bit more harder to copy um, just because there's a lot more original like stuff, but there's still a lot of trends that you can still follow on, on TikTok, TikTok as well too. On, on the TikTok side of things, like I, lo I love the app. I kind of you know, find it you know, entertaining and I'll like, it's something I can still like have fun with my girls or whatever. I can just be like, hey, look, look at these funny, funny things I'm coming yeah. across. Um, how, like, I mean, when com when clients are coming to you and thinking about like how like you know they have a business though it's quite you know like a like a, a business how do you how do you transfer that kind of business um, startup stuff to something like that's more like you know dancing and parkour you know to kind of oversimplify it or whatever but you know stay authentic or find 
their groove in in in, in new mm. medium. Yeah, so I would have, uh, there's, and this goes back to kind of the strategy I had even before TikTok and everything too, with, you know, how everybody, or at least like some of the big e com brands and other brands in general, you know, they, they, they started to become their own media company or they started purchasing assets um, of other publications or, or social channels as their own media, um, media company. Um, if you also just sit down and think about it, like if you're just going out there as a, a brand and you're going out and buying an influencer posts or their content, right? Um, you're really trying to go after their audience and those, those, those audience uh, members are consuming that content. That con their content might not necessarily be relevant to your brand per se, but th are the customers watching that still consuming that content? Then the, you know, your answer is probably yes. Well then, you can start thinking about your content and brands doesn't have to always match exactly what your product is. Um, as long as you're just like starting to create or produce content that your consumers or the people you want to go after want to want to watch, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, and if you are uh, scared about brand dilution, uh, then don't call that page per se. Um, don't exactly name it your brand or make it like a sub brand or make it an offshoot media brand or page uh, that's out there and experiment with it and see um, see how it takes hold. Um, especially, let's say like you have a serious company and you don't want to do memes, then just make a more meme-related account or brand. Uh, and if it's still attracting the audience that you're trying to go after, well then, yeah, that, that starts becoming an, an, a social media asset for you that can actually outperform your main account because you're attracting attention and, and going viral. So the way I always like to think about it and goes back to kind of one of my principles with uh, growth in general is that sometimes people are so, especially for a startup early on when I'm helping them out, um, sometimes their website, their main website, the landing page just doesn't convert. Maybe their value proposition is a little bit harder to communicate um, or it's just not very you know, sexy in terms of a, a, of a product um, for whatever reason. Um, but they still can, you know, but if they were to show their product to you a specific audience, they would probably buy it, but their, the, the content that sells it, they have might be super dry. So in that case, then I always tell them, well, can you build, um, micro, micro funnels or micro landing pages? Stop focusing on trying to build one funnel because again, it's no different than you experimenting, uh, running a growth experiment. Um, your main funnel, your main website sometimes suck. So, so, so why don't you just build a landing page that fully caters to your audience or a social media page or brand uh, that might not have to do exactly with what you are doing, but is it attracting your audience? Yes, then, then, then over time you can sustainably uh, talk about your product, put it in there, product placement, et cetera, and bring them over to your main website. And as long as it performs better, then, uh, then yeah, that, that should be your, your kind of growth lever. Um, as you're still figuring out your, your main main funnel. But some people make the mistake on trying to focus on their single funnel uh, when they can think of think outside the box of these like different lead magnets or micro lead magnets and lead funnels to attract people. And this is all the playbooks that um, if you think about it, uh, B2B and enterprise and SaaS companies, they all do. It's like they, they create these eBooks and, and value propositions that has not like their software doesn't do it per se, but uh, does it attract other like sales uh, individuals or marketers or others? Yeah, they get collect the emails and signups. And then later on, they try to sell them in the long-term game um, indirectly. Um, I think more consumer brands and e-commerce brands can do that. You don't have to create uh, a social account that is 100% matched to your brand. You could also do, uh, think about it, I think outside the box in terms of the micro funnel. Yeah, well, look, I love the concept that, you know, because people just get so precious about their brands. But to your point, love that bit where it's just like, well, it's where your audience is, not like, not where you want to be, you know, so um, love that. And, you know, you touched on a couple of things I'd like to dig deeper on. And I guess they're more on the the media side than the than the growth side. But I love, I love the chat anyway. But, you, you know, you, there's, yeah. there's kind of the concept of companies becoming more and more media companies, right? And I remember the, the you know, the concept of, um, you know, the NFL from memory or whatever, where they're like, well, we still have this, the same amount of eyeballs. It's just, they're not all on network television. They're mm -hmm. here, they're, they're on mobile, they're on this, they're streaming from this. And, and there's kind of multi, the need for the multi-channel distribution because 
again to the, you know your your last point it's like it's what the customer wants not what i want i'd love them all to come to one place it'd be nice and easy like that but they're going to consume media where they're going to consume media is this just um every company becoming a media company uh you know all the all the successful companies that can transition into it are doing it right um there's some that are not adapting fast enough and they're not being able to to catch up and I, I i would say that uh you know we're seeing a lot of the more successful companies gravitate towards in that direction and it's smart because it goes back to the idea of building your own sustainable growth if you don't own your own distribution channel then you have to continue paying ads and if you own distribution through content and becoming your own publication then you're not paying your your instead of buying ads for your own content other content creators you're spending all that into creating your own content and you become the content creator you become your own funnel uh, and you'd rather reinvest in the, in the asset or uh, or attention uh, magnet that uh, that you can control, right? And so, um, you know, if you have the budget funds, obviously that's always great. But then, if you can also just do that on the side, what, with whatever business you're doing, one, you're providing value to your uh, audience, um, and then the community, and and then also too, like, uh, yeah, you're just you're gonna, in my opinion, you're saving more money um, and also generating more results because you have more full control of the assets or the publication um for your brand um whatever it is and and like you know given that context right and i'm a startup you know that that may seem overwhelming right because i'm like shit i need to be it, on yeah yeah <laughs> it, it definitely so, yeah. is <laughs> yeah tell, so tell me what what your uh, you know i guess this comes back to picking the channels the right channels where your audience are and focusing on getting them right first right yeah, uh, but at the same time, like, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, at the same time, I would say, like, to start it really is find that, find out what you are best in, meaning are you good at, uh, what medium are you good at producing content? Are you good at writing? Are you good at audio, recording a podcast? Are you good at video like we're doing right now? Uh, are you good at just, like, creating the static images, like, through Photoshop, et cetera? Um, find something that you can do very well, fast, repeatable, and uh, and consistently. Uh, consistently, just because consistency is what makes you more treated seriously as like kind of a media brand and content. Um, and the big the biggest challenge is that a lot of people have in terms of because I've done it numerous times in terms of creating publications as an an extra growth channel asset um, on top of kind of the the startups that I build. Um, the challenge is that most people don't have a proper game plan or template of creating content and i think that it's not as hard as people think they just it's just they haven't thought about it in the way of just sitting down and, and creating all the different content templates um and I, you know for example i can just sit down on the spot here let's say like I'm, I'm building a tennis brand which i had never done before um i would just sit down and say i can make uh, tutorial content as a template i can do reviews of uh, different tennis rackets i can do reviews of courts i can interview, interview other people um I can uh, go through all, you know, all these different lists of different ideas. I, but what you saw there is just like created all these different templates now that um, the how-to tutorial would then also then spawn all these other types of content underneath that. But now I got that, that idea of how to produce that. Um, and, I, and I get into the act of actually executing my first like tutorial content. It could be easy. Um, same thing with a review, et cetera. So that's always when I sit down and think about any other brand, I always sit down and it's like, okay, um, what are the different templates of content that are super easy for us to uh, create? Um, sometimes we can go out and create content in batches as well. Um, are we just repeating all the news and interpreting news and, and sharing our thoughts on like what's happening with like the PlayStation 5 or Xbox, whatever it is to provide game news? But, you know, there's so many different angles that you can go about it and, and experiment with. And you might find that doing reviews only might be your, your forte or doing a tutorial by doing your, your or, uh, uh, be your best bet or or sometimes you just want to uh, be a critic and, and very be very opinionated and, and be uh, uh, voice your opinions and sometimes people love that too so there's different angles to go about that and I just sit down and just try to map it all as much as possible um, or go on YouTube and find out what's kind of like getting the most views and trending for that industry and topic anyways uh, and that's kind of the way I look at it it's it's just finding uh, something that works like okay let's say like you just want to do interviews um to start then that's perfectly fine um to start there uh, as your kind of like uh, brand media channel and brand um 
And what I would also say to that too is uh, at least if you could do it consistently, you don't have to do it every single day, but you've hosted like a show at once a month. Um, then, you know, at least people can, can, can think of it as a show. And if you're treating it as a show itself for a publication uh, or media brand, then people will, you know, take it a little bit more seriously. Um, so I would definitely just say like, make a nice logo and brand that is, could be separate for its own, um, own channel or, or, or media. Uh, and just start slow first, find something that's comfortable for your pace. Um, when you want to get to full flight though, is like you really just have to get the, the logistics part of creating the content fast and consistently, um, then eventually like high, as high quality as possible with a better camera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, you can probably figure out, if you can't do it too, you can always outsource it to somebody to just write one article a week for you, pay them 50 bucks to 100, if that's within your budget. Uh, at least that can start building up your channel as a, a, a growth asset. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the other thing with this kind of uh, multi-channel, you know, media idea, you know, brands being like, you know, omni-channel, I think I think got that from you. Um, but, um, you know, the idea that now that you've got like products like Linktree, you know, and we had them you know, at the last conference, the Melbourne guys, where there's, there's like, plenty of brands right now they don't even have a site right it's just like kind of sit. <laughs> yeah that's crazy yeah right it's like i'm just sit i just sit on social and i i can have a, a like a link tree saying then connects to my other social accounts and then that's where um i might not need the actual dot com right i'm just like this is, these are the places mm. you find me um anyway all right so um um, back back to growth. We'll, we'll see if we can tie it up. So, well, first of all, like yeah. so, these these <laughs> e commerce businesses that you're working on. Can you give just any any pointers there? I mean, like, I think that the one thing that's kind of become apparent even during the pandemic is like there's some e commerce, you know, brands and businesses that are really blowing up. Right? They've kind of been, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, they've been like it didn't t affect them at all. If anything, it was just like. Mm -hmm. now they're through the roof um what have you seen that kind of um i guess could be useful to um e-com founders and stuff like that um in terms of growth yeah definitely like the first and foremost my my uh growth strategy and growth channel is uh omni-channel omni mark omni-channel marketplaces meaning i am trying to distribute all my inventory on every single marketplace that I can sell. So the moment I like turned on, um, I had a Shopify store, but then I didn't have enough money initially for one of my brands um, for ads. I just started listing my products on eBay and Etsy. Uh, eBay started generating a um, couple thousand dollars a month of sale. Uh, wow. Then Etsy started picking up and Etsy started doing 20, $30,000 alone as a, as a channel. Um, had I not done that, uh, then I would have just relied on sales directly to my own channel. Of course, now the eBay and Etsy fees are definitely much more higher than if I were to want to shop by. Uh, you kind of treat that as a uh, distribution and, and marketing costs uh, to be on those platforms. But at least now I have the capital to then uh, run ads and, and profits to, to run into my ads and now grow my own Shopify site as its own um, direct to consumer uh, brand and site. Um, so, is this, you know, is like this one that I can, is this one I can share with the audience, Justin? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, <laughs> yeah so also uh yeah so it's uh one of my brands is called Man mango chan uh m-o-n-m-a-n-g-o-c-h-a-n dot co cool all right uh and uh yeah so the you know i sell for that for that brand we sell uh nintendo switch and video game accessories uh and we have our, a lot of our own original products coming out um, on top of that as we're adding more um, but that's just an example as well, too, where, um, you know, we go into some multiple channels and I want to go sell. Uh, I have a few other ones, too, that I'm, I'm in the works for, but uh, it just gives you kind of like an idea, too, the, to, to not just be on a single channel, especially if you know that e-commerce is booming. A lot of people are now are going on to all these sites like Wayfair, um, uh, Etsy's been bl uh, blown up, uh, eBay still, Amazon, obviously, Amazon resellers or Amazon sellers as well, too. You just want to be on every single channel. Obviously, calculate your fees and your profit margins. If it's still generating you a couple bucks, I mean, use that as growth capital and flow that back into what you're doing. 
or if you can at least show the sales, right? Another tactic that um, we're looking to deploy too is like we can generate like 30,000 uh, plus uh, in monthly sales and revenue. Then we can go to um, one of that fintech startups called Clear Bank. That's like Clear B A N C. Yep. Um, or other, other startups similar to that where they provide financing based off of your revenues or, um, and non dilution financing or, or credit. Uh, or, or an investment essentially to your e-commerce business based on your revenue. You're taking a loan actually, um, but they're not taking any um, uh, equity. Um, you know, they're just based on your revenue and your cash flow, um, and they're going to underwrite you and, and give you that 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 boost. Um, so you can use that then as further growth capital to to grow. Um, you know, you're always looking for at least from on the e-com side, I'm always looking for. The, the cheapest uh, lines of credit uh, so that I can continue to scale my ads, um, my inventory, my SKUs, et cetera, for, for growth um, as well. Uh, again, like another thing that I also am doing a lot is uh, user-generated content. So at least here in the States, we have a few different um, startup companies that um, one of them is called Billo, uh, Billo app, it's B-I-L-L-O. Um, I can hire a uh, influencer content creator to do like a review type of user generated content or unboxing, et cetera, for about $39 per person. Now, wow. could I go out and do it myself? Yeah. But uh, they also like so far I've had um, really good content produced as well as uh, um, so I just wanted it done fast. Right. Um, of course, you could do your own outreach, find another content creator um, to do it for you. You just have to write your own spec sheet um, to go out and outreach for. Um, but we're finding that performs very well. Again, we're just using a lot of user-generated uh, unboxings. One thing too, also is, um, it, it, you know, like my my advantage that I found on the e-commerce side is, uh, you know, a lot of people try to go towards like all the uh, drop shipping uh, route and not direct ship and and handle with customers. I always say that my my biggest growth driver for my e-com business has just been customer service um, and just delivering as fast of uh, pro uh, shipping times as possible. I, sh I almost ship every single order same day. Um, immediately just drop it off to the post office, um, not trying to like pro take along the process. Um, if I could be a little bit faster than our competitors, especially during COVID times, then there's going to be a huge advantage. They're going to want to repeat and buy stuff. Um, Cause you know, a lot of the customers, at least from our, our products in the past, we're buying it for gifts and other stuff too. And, um, right now, reliability still during COVID times has been a struggle, especially with uh, supply chain uh, and shipping issues. Um, and that just creates a huge advantage. And it'll start being uh, reflective in like your Etsy and eBay scores when you start um, having great reviews and five-star reviews um, to help you then even age and rank your, um, your seller account so that you become more reliable. And then you, your, your posts and your listings will then even, even Etsy and eBay has their own kind of like SEO um, engine inside of it. So you want to be as best as possible and you start getting all the traffic and sales, which is massive uh, on those marketplaces. Um, but if it's the last tip I would say is again, like email is still king. Social is distribution on the top to funnel people into it. Uh, email, I would always still try to collect email as much as possible and remarket email using Shopify, MailChimp, or Clavio, uh, Clavio, uh, um, K-L-A-B-I-Y-O. Um, as uh, your email marketing and email automation uh, system. Um, if you talk to all the great e-commerce marketers um, and brands out there, email is still number one, um, no matter what. And um, even though social, I think social is obviously, if somebody can hit social very hard with, with uh, influencer marketing, then yeah, that's great. But I think powered together influencer marketing with emails um, would just still absolutely crush and generate you the uh, the revenues that you look to need um, to make. Absolutely. And just, just, just one last question on that. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Justin, is, um, are you using like a, a channel advisor or something like that to manage the district, the multi-channel distribution? Oh yeah. That's a good, that, yeah, that's a good question. And so that's like another important part too, is um, you don't want to double sell, right? You don't want to double sell, like you take one product, you sell on Etsy, you got to pull it from your inventory um and and manage that all so there's like a few different platforms out there um, one of them that we saw was called multiorders.com uh another one is uh, I, i'd have to get a few other names too but if you just search in like multi-inventory management systems there's a few other ones that exist out there 
Um, what I would say though, from us doing a lot of research is you got to run into the tr trial it out and you just have to go through kind of like the purchasing and customer flow. Um, basically you just have to just troubleshoot the whole journey of when somebody buys something from eBay uh, and, and Etsy and all these different platforms um, or Shopify. Um, is there like a system, a central systems or record that just maintains your inventory um, to, to maintain, um, uh, prevent double sell? Um, but does it also work in your workflow too? Sometimes these platforms are good at inventory management, but they actually aren't good to handle your actual shipping uh, and printing shipping labels um, because they have really bad integrations. Uh, it's super hard to find an all-in-one platform, to be honest, and sometimes you have to like stitch it together or have two different platforms, the ones to do fulfillment, other ones just to be a central uh, system of record. Um, that's just the nature of e-com still right now. It's just so many different platforms and, and the data flow is just a little bit tough. So um, I would always say just trial and find what works good for you or go to like T2 Crowd or uh, those other like uh, app review sites to just uh, find uh, the different tools and platforms that can, can um, uh, help you out. Uh, oh yeah, the other other brand that we also use is called Order Hive, but Order Hive is really good. Uh, it's just expensive um, Order to, to run. Order hive, like a beehive. Oh, yeah, all right. Cool. Yeah, so again, just play around, find what works for you. Um, there's some extra benefit that can help uplift your sales using those platforms. One of them is to um, usually when somebody orders from like Etsy, they can extract an email, same thing with eBay. Um, Got to take a look at their marketing integrations if they have that. Some of the platforms like multi orders won't do that. So it, that's why we have to cancel our multi orders account because while they can do inventory management, if it can't do the, it can't if it can't extract emails, if it can't do remarketing and email marketing on it, then it's kind of useless to us. Um, and that's the challenge is, is looking at it from the full funnel top and down. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, for those uh, for those platforms. Man, look, I um, you know really appreciate your time. Um, you know, we covered everything from like we get some growth strategies from multi-channel, you know, social media through to multi-channel, you know, distribution on e-com. My, I wrote, I wrote heaps of notes, man. I'm just going to start an online store now for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Appreciate, appreciate your time, Justin. And, um, and where are people finding you these days? Excited from like buying, making sure they get their Nintendo switch stuff. And, <laughs> and go Tell me where else. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can just find me on like Twitter, uh, Justin Wu, uh, or my handle, uh, it's a little bit harder to spell, but it's hackerpreneur, H A C K A P R. E N E U R. So it's like hackathon with entrepreneur at the end. Uh, yeah, that's just always me. I mean, that's where I started. I started in the hackathons, and then uh, always trying to hack my my hack growth, and that's where I became a hackerpreneur. Always hacking growth uh, as much as possible. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Man. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Feel free to reach out to me too on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I'm always respond to all my messages as much as possible um, in a reasonable time. So. Awesome, up. man. Let's Hopefully. Chat, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Justin. And um, yeah, catch you next time. Awesome. Always a pleasure.